Odin, I had a lot of fun working with you today. Are you comfortable with me touching you? No, he said no. Um, this is his roadmap to success. And as you can see, he's a lot more comfortable around me before, but again, I'm showing him respect by not touching him. Um, and eventually we'll get past this point, but his ears are a little bit back and he's kind of kind of looking up at me. And when I leaned, when I reached over to pet him, he kind of leaned a little bit away and his pupils are dilated. So those are things that tell me he's not comfortable. Um, basically in this video, we're gonna go over the roadmap to success. Um, now I think the collar has uh, slipped a little bit, which is fine for this video. But when you do this, what you want to do is put the martingale collar on him, attach the leash, put the loop that the uh, leash is attached to, come, uh, in the, on his spine. Then you're going to run the leash around his chest behind uh, both front legs in his armpits. And then you go back through it and then loop. You're going to go through the loop always towards the head, never towards the butt. So if I'm holding the loop here, I run the leash this way, never this way. I want it to be able to relax when we're done. Uh, you would be able to see it, but he is a fluff ball, so you can't see that he's wearing a collar and there's a leash there, but there is. Um, sit. Good job, buddy. So um, this that was a, basically an example of passive training, which is one of the tips that I shared with the guardians. Passive training involves rewarding the dog anytime it does a desired action or behavior voluntarily, organically, on its own. So every time the dog sits next to the guardian, I like them to reach over and pet him and say, sit. Every time the dog lays down, we want to pet him and say crash or whatever the word is to lay down. Try to use fun command words, especially when you're coming up with the new commands that we talked about. Uh, the more we come up with fun commands, we just bring some levity to the situation. <laughs> yes, I know. It's tough. It's been four hours. Sit. So right there. Now, for maybe for the guest, wouldn't want to do the passive training, but for the humans, passive training is great. So every time the dog comes to you, pet him and say come. Every time he sits, pet him and say sit. Every time he lays down, crash. And I also say reward. So if somebody in the family says roar to me, I would reach over and pet him and say either if he's sitting, I pet him and say sit. If he's standing, I assume he just came to me and I missed it and the family member saw it and they alerted me to that. It gives me the ability to pet him. Sit. Now, if I can't pet him, then the guest could say sit, but this is, again, stuff for the family members, not for the guests. Um, so passive training is, is the easiest way to train any dog to do anything. Every time he brings you a specific toy, you might want to name the toy and call it you know, Thor or Hammer or what, you know, since we're on a little Marvel kick. Good boy. Um, and that would have been better to say sit instead of good boy. Um, and so you can name all your toys. Those can help boost his self-esteem. Um, now we did this because towards the end of the session, he started, I think he's just tired because it's been a long session. We're almost at four hours at this point. Yeah, I know I'm yawning too. Um, and uh, so he kind of, I think he's a little bit cranky like we get, and so he needs a little bit of a uh, refresher. When we have guests come over in the video we talked about above, that should be like, you know, half an hour to hour visit maximum. Um, and if he's reactive, once he calms down, you know, and the person has to leave, so we might want to try to find guests that are in, in close proximity first and not somebody who lives way across town or in Gretna or something like that. Um, okay, so passive training, that's good. that sniffing is also a really good sign. He hasn't done much of that for me uh, this session, so it tells me he's comfortable enough to want to check me out. Um, all right, passive training is the easiest. The second, uh, almost as easy as passive training is what I call petting with a purpose. And he right now jumps up on his guardians when he wants attention from them, and they give him attention. Petting a dog is how we pay our dog. So if the dog demands attention from me and I pet him, that's one of the ways we tell him that he's more important than me or has more authority than me. So instead, when he jumps up on us, what I'd like to do is tell him to sit, when he sits, pet him under his chin and say the word sit and nothing else. Not good sit. And don't say sit. See how he moved. Uh, dogs hear inflection. So we want to say the command words consistently because the inflection uh, way of saying it, is, it makes it a completely unique, different command word. So uh, passive tra or petting with a purpose is simply just giving him a redirection. He, he jumps up on us. He paws at me. He nudges at me. I, give, I tell him to sit. If he's already sitting here, I might ask him to sit, him sit here. I might ask him to lie down, whatever it is. He just has to do something to change his state in order to get attention from the human. And as soon as he does, remember you have three seconds to correct or reward your dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. So as soon as he sits, I want to be petting him within that three seconds. Now I say reward for passive training. If somebody says reward, I don't ask what it was. I just immediately start petting the dog and say whatever, the, almost narrate whatever the dog's doing. If I ask, I've already blown the three second window. Uh, petting with a purpose, uh, just the dog has to do something to earn it first. And after a while, it'll start manding and it'll start coming up and uh, sitting on its own to prepay for attention. And when it does that, make sure we do recognize and reward that. And that's why we'd say reward to other people. Otherwise, the dog will go back to scratching, digging, and jumping up on us. Um, okay, uh, we also went over the importance of rules and structure. I think that he has, he's basically almost uh, has a dog version of PTSD. I think that he had a bad experience when he was a puppy 
and that probably created a little tension and anxiety. But the guardians have also been petting him at times when he's nervous or, or fearful to try to placate and soothe him, which is a normal human trait, but for dogs it actually backfires. Anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing. This includes excitement, which many people confuse for happiness. The dog can be excited and not happy, you can be happy and calm. They can also be excited and happy, and they frequently are, but if my dog is excited and I pet it when it's excited, I'm making it more excited each time I do that. And after a while, the dog will get so excited, he will have excited urination, which he has. Um, or sometimes the dog will nip because they're just so worked up. Just like us, if we're too emotional, we might say the wrong thing to someone and apologize and say later, oh, I didn't mean that, you're actually a great cook. We just, in the moment, we might say the wrong thing when we're out of balance. So we want him to be go into balance. But because he hasn't had a lot of rules or structure, I think his in his mind, he's thought, how can I contribute to this group? Well, they're pretty relaxed about who comes and goes, so I'm gonna make myself in charge of security. And we also have some negative association. When guest comes over and he barks and he's telling the humans, danger, danger, this guest might be doing something bad, you gotta keep your eye on him, and we ignore or chastise the dog, that stresses the dog out, makes the dog bark even more. And it gets to the point where they finally start putting him in a kennel upstairs. So now dogs are living through association, so this causes the dog to think when a human comes over, I get punished and removed from the group. And that makes it even worse. So we'd like to, as I talked in the video above, have guests come over and practice being the part of a guest. Guests that will listen, not guests that are gonna be uh, just tell him anything they want or try to pet him or do things that you don't want because we need him to feel comfortable and confident. Sit. Sit. Uh, and okay, he's not, he's like, I'm still not, and if he doesn't take a treat, that's one of our indicators that he's, he is a little bit more, he's a little out of balance, he's a little bit too worked up. So um, to help the flip the leader follower dynamic, we've talked about adding structures such as rules. One of the rules we suggest is not being allowed in the furniture. Sorry, buddy. Uh, uh, at least for 30 days or as long as the problem's still going on because the higher a dog sits, the more rank or social status they have. Um, and then after that point, it's an invitation with, uh, or permission with an invitation, and that's a one-time pass. So if I invite him up, he starts barking, he has to get down. If we put him in the bed and we invite him in our bed, and he tries to get him between the husband and wife, you have to get down. If you're gonna come on the bed, you're gonna sleep here in this designated area. If you're gonna sit here, this is for good behavior. As soon as you start barking, you lose this privilege. As soon as you try to go to the wrong place, you lose the privilege. Or if I invite him up and he goes and gets a drink of water, when he comes back, he would need another invitation to get back on the furniture. Another rule would be not to be within seven feet of a human who is eating or in the kitchen while people are preparing food, humans who are eating at the table. Maybe we set up a boundary and help him practice only being in the carpet, not being on the wooded area while people are eating at the dinner table. Now, how do we accomplish this? People ask me a lot. Um, I went through a series of three es or four escalating consequences and really to accomplish that, what we would do is we'd use a combination of the third escalating consequence and practice. When we learn as humans, we learn in a classroom environment and we're encouraged to try things out, and there's no pressure because it's not the real world deal. We learn each individual step one at a time, and we practice each step one at a time until we're ready for the next step. Well, for dogs, some reason, we decide we're gonna train you in the real world when it's happening, and you're all worked up, which is the absolute worst. We put our dog in a position to fail. So what we might do for that is we might set the dinner table like we normally do. And instead of actually putting our food down, we might practice a half an hour before dinner. Mom might take a piece of roast beef and microwave it and then bring it over like it's a serving tray, and everybody sits in the normal spots at the table, and then we cut it up and we put the roast beef on people's plates. Now before we do this, we don't allow the dog in the kitchen. If it crosses the threshold, we march directly at it. Dog goes this way, I beat it this way, and keep on walking towards and taking territory until it gets on the carpet. Once again, on the carpet, we stop enforcing at the point of contact or where the boundary is. Now if the boundary is right here and I'm a dog, I'm gonna try to jump this way so the human takes a step to the side and walks here, step to the side there. And what, you keep on doing that until the dog stops trying to challenge you. And when the dog is stationary, then I take two steps backwards. One, two, and I wait. The dog stays in put, then I take another two steps backward. But what really is gonna happen, the first time you step back, the dog's gonna come forward. As soon as it does, you rush back towards that line. And you don't cross the line. And as soon as the dog gets across the line, you stop. So if you're several feet into the kitchen, you take two steps towards the dog and it gets up. You don't have to go all the way to the line, just until the dog gets back across and have some steam in your step, move quickly. Um, and then eventually the dog will sit or lie down. When it does, you take a big step backwards anytime it sits. When it lays down, you can take a couple steps away. And then we go back to sitting at the table and then mom comes, brings the roast beef over and we practice eating with the dog in here. Now when we're eating, we're actually thinking about eating. We're hungry, we're eating and, and the dog is being a nuisance. We're trying to shove them away in the moment. 
So we practice with the roast beef and we recreate the situation. We teach the dog how we want it to behave and help it practice. Just because it smells like food doesn't mean I have permission to go in there. And once the dog lays down and is no longer challenging, the mom gets up and picks up the roast beef and goes put it and grabs the real meal and we sit down. So maybe not half an hour, maybe five minutes before eating. Uh, but this way we can actually train the dog when we're eating, you're not allowed to be in the kitchen, in the dining room. And the same thing, I would put maybe painter's tape down and pretend practice cooking. And then you move him out beyond, and I would put painter's tape from the work island to the edge by the dishwasher, work island to the edge of the refrigerator so he knows, and you know where the point of contact is. But again, whenever your dog has a behavior problem, you need to ask yourself, have I taught the dog how it's supposed to behave? If I haven't, then how can I reverse engineer the, the situation, the scenario, and peel back all the layers except for one, and help the dog practice the very first step, crash, uh, by itself, and practice that over and over till it's got that down on autopilot. Only then do we go to the second step, and then the third step. And so by breaking it individual steps, it's easy, and it's not a real world situation, so there's no pressure. And then we help the, and we can help the dog uh, put, put it in position to succeed by doing things like getting an exercise before we practice these things. Like before a guest comes over, we should take the dog for a long walk and give it a recovery period. So when the guest comes over, we've depleted that excess energy and put the dog in position to succeed. Um, okay, let me see what else. The, the humans need to eat something before they feed the dog. I'd also like the guardians to uh, uh, take turns. I'd like each guardian to find four tricks or commands on YouTube. You can Google it as well. And then each Sunday or whatever day of the week, one of the, uh, the humans whose turn it is that week will take Odin off to the side and teach him how to bang your dead. Don't teach him to shake. He already jumps up and that's kind of silly, uh, affiliated with it. So teach him to balance a treat on his nose. Teach him to stay. Teach him to roll over. Teach him to go fetch a beer out of the refrigerator, whatever it is. But he, and then we teach him that one trick and then the human teaches the other two humans what the command is. And then all week long we practice that trick. The next week the next human takes over and we repeat the process. So at the end of three months, we've taught him 12 new tricks or commands. And don't have to be tricks. I taught my dog to back up. That's a very helpful command. If he's in my way, I say retreat and he backs up four paces. That helps out a lot. So coming up with tricks and commands will help boost his self-esteem, will also help the humans practice assuming the leadership role in the dog's eyes, and also give them ways to redirect the dog's attention. One of the things I did is I taught them how to teach him how to focus. Let's see if you'll be interested in taking that. Yeah, okay, and laying down is again, as I talked about in the above video, that's an indication that he's comfortable. So teaching him to focus, if you forget how to do that, message me and I can send you links so you can actually have an exercise when I go through it, but I think everybody did it pretty well. I'd like the guardians to actually practice the focus. He's gonna take a nap after I leave. Uh, it's um, almost three o'clock, so maybe four o'clock, we should have somebody practice. And practice the focus in different parts of the house, and I like each of the humans to practice twice a day with the focus exercise. Um, in different locations of the house and not all in a row. So that way he gets practiced uh, and again, work your way up to 20 seconds by the end of the first week. Uh, let me see, um, I went through all the instructions about uh, guests in the video above. Um, so that's great. Um, follow, I have the guests watch that video before they come over so they kind of know what they're coming in for. Um, something else I like the guardians to do is start an exercise journal. He is under exercise. Now we're getting a, we got a kind of a not a good guy that, that was going to put a fence in and he flaked out on us, but we got another guy and we're going to put a fence in here. And when we do, that's going to make things a lot easier for the dog for exercise. We can fetch him inside, outside, but remember you can fetch him inside as well. So um, start the exercise journal, write the day at the top and then write the time and how many fetches, how many laser routes, how many, uh, how long we went for a walk or whatever it is. And then at the end of the day, give it a letter grade of based on his behavior, A through F. And then next day, maybe add in an extra fetch or add in a couple quantities extra and different exercises. Play around with the values until eventually you, you get to the point where, wow, that was an A day. Okay, now we know what we need to do to get him to feel comfortable by taking that edge off. For him, we're gonna attack his problem through a, multiple, a multitude of angles. We're gonna change the leader follow dynamic. We're gonna teach him what he can do to make it that we like, that uh, we reward him for. We're going to teach him that he can't tell us what to do, but when he does what we do, there's a reward or benefit for it. Um, we're going to have structural things like feeding him after we eat, not walking around him, walking through, making sure that we go through the door first and things like that. And all these things are going to help reduce his level of stress and anxiety. And then we get to the point where he's not as reactive as he is. I think part of his reaction is, again, he's got cortisol in his blood. He's got PTSD. Uh, but the more that we uh, assume that leadership role, and reward him for desired actions, he's gonna start emulating those desired actions and stop feeling like he needs to be responsible for us because we don't listen to him. 
And so then he stops telling us what to do, and then we remove that stress because it's not, number one, he's, they're not listening to me. Number two, they seem to be in charge. Number three, you know, I don't have to worry about it because they're taking care of me as opposed to me taking care of them. Uh, let me see, what else? Um, I'm going to give uh, the Guardians a, uh, and normally he would be freaking out about this, but the, the leash is preventing him from doing anything. Um, I'm going to give the Guardians uh, one of these cards. This is from my favorite pet store in Omaha, a place called The Green Spot. And this will get $5 off whatever you buy there. Um, I saw that they were, had given him uh, bullies, uh, uh, raw hides. And raw hides are soaked in bleach and ammonia, so we really, they're not very good for dogs. They actually cause some health issues. But bully sticks, uh, kneecaps, tracheas, chicken feet, uh, duck feet, um, uh, cod skin, uh, codfish skins. All these things can be, uh, are great for dogs. They enjoy them. So what we might want to do is get some of these ingest, uh, uh, things that we can actually have the dog have uh, or the dog can actually chew on that they enjoy doing. So what we might do is actually, once the, he's comfortable with the guest and he's laid down, another thing that we didn't go over the guest, the guest might actually then pull out a bully stick and put it right here on the ground. And then he gets to chew the bully stick or has the kneecap, but only when the hum, he's next to the human. So as, the hum, as soon as the human takes the foot off the leash and he's free, if he gets up and goes away, we take the, the item away. Now don't snatch it from him. He doesn't know how to fetch. Well, he knows how to fetch, but he doesn't like to give it because the humans have been taking things from him. So I'd like the guardian to practice a drop exercise. So when he has a low value item, an item he's allowed to have, just hold a treat, touch his nose like that, and wait, don't give him any commands, wait for him to drop it. Remember, anytime we give a treat, we should say the command word after the treat goes in the mouth. So, uh, so the dog opens, finally opens his mouth and drops the ball or whatever the thing is that's a low value item. We pop the treat in the mouth and we say the word drop and we don't go for the item. We want to practice that every time we see him having a low value item. Now, a kneecap or trachea or those sort of things wouldn't work because that's a high value item. But we want to practice so that he learns if I drop, the human's going to give me something really good and I get my object back 99% of the time. So that's a really good trade or a deal. Then when we're playing fetch, when we throw the ball, we throw it. I say fetch three times. As I throw it, I say fetch as I throw it. When the dog goes over and picks up with his mouth, I say the word fetch. And when it comes, comes back to me, I'm holding a treat out comes and tries to take it with the object in his mouth, finally it like drops the ball and I pop the treat in the mouth and I would say the word fetch. So this way you actually teach the dog how to play fetch and fetch is a much better way to uh, burn energy than a walk. Walks are great for leadership. Um, let me see, anything else I'm forgetting? I don't think so. Okay, well uh, this is Odin uh, and he's, uh, it's not the football player, it's uh, Marvel Comics and uh, Odin is Thor's father I just learned. So um, this is Odin and this is his roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.